All right. So I want to welcome everybody to Torah is for everyone. Now, this week, I'm going to do it a little bit differently this week because Sonia is new. And Sonia, ha you haven't read the Torah, right? Right. So you're right at the beginning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, it's interesting because there are five books in the Torah. Right. You speak Hebrew, right? No. Oh, no. It's, it was your brother-in-law who spoke yes. Hebrew. Okay. So the five books consist of the first four books are the ones Moses wrote. The fifth one is they're not sure if he wrote it or not, but it gives us, it's a, it's a book of stories. Everybody thinks that it's a religious book, that you have to be religious to read it. But really the story is, it's the history of our people. It teaches us where we come from and, and really where we're going. And it teaches us how to live. It's a story of how God brought a people, formed a nation, the Israelites, of whom we are all a part, and how he brought us to a special land called Israel, the promised land. And he gave us a code of living, and they're called the Ten Commandments. But it just occurred to me that I, I started, but I didn't introduce you to my friends. So you'll see Miriam. Miriam, I know for over 30 years. She's uh, one of the founding members of our community. Baruch has also been with us over 30 years. Oops. Yeah. I lost, I lost you. You lost me? Did you find me again? I, uh, yes. Okay, but good. I don't, good. I don't see very clearly all the other participants. Maybe you're not on gallery view. You have to go to your oh. view at the top and turn it on gallery view. Where's the oh, view? View, and then you click on it, and you'll see gallery. Gallery. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Yes, and then I you see everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And Jerry, I met Jerry when I sang at this at the Shawmity Seniors. Oh, yeah. Which so is. Where's Jerry? He's not here. Yeah, yeah, he's there. Can you see oh. him? Oh, that's Jerry. Okay. That's Jerry. He's Have wearing you know glasses. You're wearing you. glasses, so I couldn't recognize you. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Baruch is also wearing glasses. <laughs> so the book that we're doing now is one that's a little more complicated than the rest. It takes place in a period of only about a month while the Jews were in the desert. And it's about how the priesthood, the Kohanim, were inaugurated. And um, it's actually among the Hasidim, on the Orthodox Jews, they start with this book. And it's a, a, even though to me it's quite a difficult book. So what I usually do, Sonia, is I share the screen. We read it. Now, we're reading it from a very different perspective because we have to understand that God didn't speak to people who were very educated. When we left Egypt, we had been slaves for over 200 years. You knew that, right? Yeah. Do you know when we left Egypt? When the time of year it was? Do you have any idea? Well, we're at that time now. We're coming up to what holiday? What's holiday in two weeks? Pass Passover. It, exactly, Pesach. Pesach, yeah. Yeah, and the story of Pesach yeah. is how God, after 10 plagues, freed us from Egypt. And some of the plagues that we're seeing in the world are almost the same as the 10 plagues that we went through then. So we went through these ten, these plagues. He freed us from Egypt. He, he made us into a nation, brought us to Mount Sinai, and gave us, who knows what he gave us? Yeah. What did he give us? Baruch is on something else. The Ten Commandments. Exactly. He gave us the Ten Commandments. Now, most people don't even know what the Ten Commandments are. And it's very important that we understand what they are. Because if we understand what these Ten Commandments are, we have the foundation, the basis of how to live. So the first three of the commandments have to do with who our God is. Number one, he's the God who brought us out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, and we are to have no other gods. 
The second one is we're not to make any images, no statues, not to bow down to these gods, like we got into trouble with the golden calf. And then the third yeah. one, don't take his name in vain. When you take something in vain, it means that it's um, you, you're not honoring his name. You, you change his words. You say things that he didn't say. It's you, you, you're changing the, the, who God is. The two middle ones, the fourth and the fifth, are for, the, for us. The fourth one is keep the Sabbath. Don't work on the Sabbath day. That's all it says. And the fifth one is to honor mother and father. That, that one's for us so that we could live long on this earth. And the Shabbat also helps us. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Of course. Yeah, just a question, Peggy, just the thing about, because it hit me so long, even after my 30 years with the congregation, yeah. the fourth commandment hit me so hard when it, it said, okay, we keep the Shabbat, Shabbat, Sabbath, because really it's a sign to us that God is who he says he is. It says, because God created the world, blah, blah, blah. The point is, is that to me, it said, oh, keep the Sabbath day because it's a sign uh, uh, that God. Between me and the children is, of Israel, that me, in children, six that, days. That he's real. He exists. That's the way I, it hit me. I said, so that's what it is. It's not just an order to, to it, it's a special day, which it's almost a myst mystical mystery that God created this world. Exactly. It's, I, I made me a, totally. Uh, gave me a whole different perspective on it. Exactly, and if you see, if you right go back to the beginning of Genesis when he created that seventh day, he said this is a sign for us to know that he exists. Right, Sonia. What were you going to ask? Well, the story goes that Moses is the one who took out the Jewish people from the slavery and yes. took them to the Mount Sinai. Yes, he was, led us. It was God. God's work that God the God took the Jewish people out of slavery and brought them to Mount Sinai. Right. How do we know that all the stories are true? That's a very good question. As soon because as you these have are the stories. Answer, these are stories. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. okay, they wrote the scriptures, everything, but I don't know. How would you answer that, Miriam? I'm thinking about that. I think you can't have proof like the way you say one and one is two or, the, or you know, it's not that kind of proof. First thing is is whether or not you feel in your life you've had, this is my opinion, my experience, that you've had some touch from something bigger than us in life. What I would say God. If you've had that experience, uh, then step by step, you start to see that there's order in the universe and there's a history, that God uh, is the God of history and that these things really happen. There really is historical data to show. I think they found certain things about, about Mount Sinai and, and all these things, um, but it's not a proof like a scientific proof, but based on a premise that you have a, a, a a knowledge or an understanding that there is a God or the beginning, the seed of a knowledge, even if you're questioning, to me, it's based on that. And then you see that that God uh, is the God of history. And there there are many proofs that these things happen. Remember they said about finding the uh, the wheels uh, in the Red Sea, in, in that sea, they found spokes and wheels. But little by little, they have found things, historical things, Things that make the some of parts of history actually, uh, you know, the artifacts have been found to show that these things happen. But other than that, you really can't prove anything to anybody. I don't believe you can. But if you have any, even the fact that you're on this Zoom meeting, either you're searching for something or you're yearning for something. Sonia, do you, do you understand sort of what I'm saying? Like. Because yeah, there's, there's yeah, something but... like that. I don't have, you know, there's, I, I can't answer it any better than that. You Jerry, know, that... what would you say to that? What would I say? Well, 
It's a very good question, Sonia. Sonia? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very, very, very good question. That question is so good that almost every person in the world asks themselves that question. There's 8 billion people in the world. So 8 billion questions. Mind the, the kids don't ask the questions yet. Now, in the previous days, we are aware of the history of the Jewish people. It's very well documented. And uh, uh, 2000 years and the first temple and the second temple that we, we more than less know that we more than less know that we had a temple that we had a we have a country that Israel now in the beginning God made himself known to some of the people so and he, he started the ball rolling now if God Wait, would I'm be, sorry Jerry it was Abraham who discovered this God because right. all the other people they believed in statues and blah 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 well, but it was Abraham, also, Abraham was but the it was first one. No, it was before okay. Abraham. First of all, Adam okay, and Eve. But Ab Abraham, Ab Abraham came to acknowledge God, and uh, that's through his own. We don't know his own intuition. I'm not even sure what the word means, but he came to realize that there is a God. Now, I'm going to take an individual like you for now, Sonia, because you asked the question. Now you're allowed to do certain things in your life right now. So God allows you to do those things. And he also, you're guided by people that you're meeting now, like Peggy and this and that, to help to guide you. Uh, you ha we have a manual. Like when you buy a new machine, there's a manual, how to use it. We have a manual. The Torah is like our manual, how we should conduct ourselves. Now. If God was right there beside you right now, he would tell you what to do and you would have to do exactly that. And if you have to do exactly, exactly what God tells you, you're not what we would call the creation of a human being. You're like an angel. In other words, God says, go to the left, you go to the left, go to the right, you go to the right. So if you were to see God right now, and he told you what to do, you would be an angel. Now, he made humans very special. He made them in his image. And what does that mean? It means that he gave us the ability to make up your own mind. Now, you came here, you made up your mind. Nobody twisted your arm. You came here, you thought, you, hopefully you'll come more, whatever, but, but it's your choice. Now, if God was to open your front door and say, Sonia, you must go on to Peggy, you wouldn't have a choice. Now, since he gives you this choice, he cannot like sit on your head and tell you what to do. So you have to, you have that choice. Since you have that choice, he does not sit on you. So. He, so you can't know this here like right in front of you. So you have to believe and you have to have faith. That's part of it. You, you have to think about it. You would not have a free choice or would not be uh, known. You would not be able to do what you want. You do what you want, what you think you want. Maybe he's guiding you. But tonight you wanted to come. You came. If God would have tell you to come or not to come, you wouldn't have that choice. So he cannot stand in the front of you and tell you what to do and give you a choice. So that's why he leaves a lot of room for you to come to God by yourself. He wants you to come to God. He doesn't want God to force you. So that's why you cannot, he does not show himself 100% clearly the way you would like right now but he does to some people each of us um there are people who um have a special calling like like abraham had that calling but so did noah 
Before Abraham, there was Noah. You know, Abraham wasn't a Jew. You know that, eh, Sonia? I did know that. Yeah, there were no Jews yet on this planet, because you you it starts. We start with Adam and Eve, and then yes, Adam, and and it says that God walked in the garden with Adam and gave him only one rule to live by: Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on that day you will die. We go down in history, and we see the, another story in in our in our Torah, the story of Noah. Noah was living on a mountain. And, and the people at that time, if we think it's bad now, it was worse then. There was terrible violence everywhere, and God decided to destroy the whole world. As a matter of fact, the world word for violence in the in the book of and in the story of Noah, the book, the word for violence is Hamas, just like today with the Hamas. But so God destroyed the world, but before he did, he sent the flood, he told Noah to build an ark. Noah got on the ark with his wife, his three sons, and the three daughter-in-laws, and all the animals who God brought to the ark. And then the ark was filled, and all the people on earth except one family died. Now, these are stories. Whether they're true or not, we can't know, except with this story, in very many nations around the world, very many uh, societies, they have a, an ancient story of a flood. There are ways of saying, okay, the, the, that did happen. But there's something that happens when God touches you. I don't know how to explain it. I do know that I was touched in my life at a time when I was very, very low. It's like things just started to happen to show me how real he is. And now I have such a sense of, 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 of how he's always there with me, guiding me and showing me what to do and helping me to make. Can the you right give decision. me an example? How did you, how did you feel this sign of God? Oh, there's so many examples. When I first came, I was always on a search for, for answers for answers to why we have pain, why we suffer, why we struggle. And it brought me through many, many experiences. Most, it started in medicine when I was involved in medicine. I later be, got more involved in the psychological and the emotional aspects. I have a very long story, but I was very driven to find answers. Thanks. And they br it brought me through things that I later found out were not so good to be involved in what's known today as the occult, the new age. And it almost destroyed my life. I can talk to you more about it at another time because it'll take up the whole hour here. But after, um, when I came home back to Montreal, I had left, I had lost everything. And my cousin brought me, uh, I went to my cousin's house and I was telling her about my life and open, it opened the, she opened the, the Torah to me and she opened the book of Devarim, Deuteronomy. And she said, and she read it to me. She said that um, when Moses was brought into the land, he was told by God not to have anything to do with the pagan practices that were there. They were an abomination to God. And I read them and I went, oh my goodness, I did this one, which was astrology. I was involved in all kinds of things that God said, do not touch them. They're an abomination. And I went, oh my God, why? why? How to come nobody ever told me? So I started going to the Bible studies and reading and learning. And But this Bible study was what I found out later, what my cousin's had converted to Christianity. And so I went through Christianity, but there were things there that I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe that Jesus was the creator of the universe. I had big problems with that. Really? I, couldn't, I couldn't believe in a trinity where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those things just, just didn't make sense to me. So I left that and came and and when my rabbi came to Montreal, we founded this community. 
this congregation. And but I watched God help me in ways that I can't even begin to, um, to, to tell you how many miracles I saw happen in my life. Just like the miracles of how we, uh, when we were in the, in the desert and we, we didn't have water, we fetched and God sent water. He, hmm. we, we were hungry. God sent us manna in the wilderness. Every time we needed something, he was there with us for 40 years in the desert, watching over us, taking care of us. And most of us don't realize just how many things God is providing for us. We think we do it on our own, but we are never alone. But let me stop for one minute because I want to say hello to Paul. Hello. Yeah, he found it. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Paul. He doesn't Paul, hear. Paul, can you hear us? Yeah, he's on mute. You have Put to, on mute. Off, you have to yeah. get off mute to, in order to be able to speak. Anyway, we'll let you we'll let you get acclimatized. So um it's it's all somehow Sonia what God, is it Peggy I'm sorry to interrupt you you said okay. that God helps you help the Jewish people blah 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 how come there were so many uh what is it uh oh the Jewish people were always why do we suffer yeah yes always that's, always that's why we that's why we've been reading the Torah and because yeah, the but Torah, there's so many religious people were following the book of the Torah, very, very religious people who really did it, the, and they were burned to death. Okay, let me Where tell was you the God? difference. Let me, that's a very good question. Let me, there's a difference, Sonia, between yes. being religious and really trusting the creator of the universe. You see, religions, there are many religions in this world now including yeah. including Judaism. Judaism is a religion. Yeah. But there's two types of Judaism. There's the Judaism that's called rabbinic Judaism where the rabbis have added many things to the Torah and one of the things it says in the Torah if you if you read it and that's why I started this group so that we could read what God tells us then we know what was added or taken away you know when you there's when the the government trains people to learn how to detect counterfeit money from the real money they train the person by having them look at the real thing for weeks and weeks and weeks and studying it then when they see the counterfeit they know it immediately when you read the torah for what it says not for what other people say it says, that's when you know when you're do doing the right thing or when you're being religious. Because there are people who look very religious, very pious, very holy, very, you know, we're better than others. Look what we do. But God wants us to be humble. Let me show you one verse. I'm going to, I'm. you know what? We were going to do Chazria, but I'm going to share the screen with you here. And I'm going to turn to a verse. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. I'm going to go to Deuteronomy. You see, we have five books of the Torah. Genesis, right. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, yeah. mm -hmm. and Deuteronomy. Right. I'm going to go into Deuteronomy, and I'm going to go to chapter 28. Okay? And we're going to read it. Now, now if you obey your God, his name in Hebrew is yud He vav He. We don't know how to pronounce it now, but it's been lost. To observe faithfully all the divine commandments, meaning the Ten Commandments, which I commanded you this day, your God, he's speaking to Israel now, he's speaking to our people, your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. This is what he's telling us. All these blessings shall come upon you and take effect if you will only heed, listen, the word in Hebrew, tishma, guard, the word, the, the, the commandments of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the issue from your womb. In other words, the women will get pregnant easily. They won't have any problem. 
The produce of your soil will have lots of food. The offspring of your cattle will be blessed. The calving of your herd, the lambing of your flock. Of course, that was that day. But in today's um, words, it would be your businesses will be blessed. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. You know, everything that we have in our homes will be blessed. Blessed you shall be in your comings and blessed shall you be in your goings. yud heh vav -Hey, the creator of the universe, will put to rout before your enemies who attack you. They will march out against you by a single road, but flee from you by many roads. You see, God will protect us if we obey. The Lord will ordain blessings for you upon your barns, upon your undertakings. In other words, your bank account will be full. You will be blessed in the land that your God is giving you. yud heh vav -Hey will establish you as God's holy people, kadosh, meaning we're set apart from the rest to be orlegoim, a light to the nations, as was sworn to you, God told Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that if we would be obedient, he would put us, he would bless us, and we would bless, so we could bless the rest of the nations. If you keep the commandments of your God and walk in God's ways, he's teaching us halacha, his halacha, how to walk. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that the Lord, yud heh vav -Hey's name is proclaimed over you, that God, that we are God's people, and all the peoples of the earth shall stand in fear of you. How? If we keep his commandments and walk in his ways, the Lord will give you abounding prosperity in the issue of your womb. You'll have many children, your cattle, many cattle, your produce, your businesses will prosper that the Lord swore to your fathers to assign to you. The Lord will open up for you the bounteous store, the heavens to provide rain for your land in season and to bless all your undertakings. You will be creditor to many nations. In other words, we will lend to nations, but we will not be in debt to any. The Lord will make you the head of all the nations, not the tail. You will always be at the top and never at the bottom if only you obey and faithfully observe the commandments of the Lord that I command you this day, meaning the Ten Commandments. Do not deviate to the right or to the left from any of the commandments that I enjoin upon you this day or turn to the worship of other gods. But... Listen carefully now. But if you do not obey your God to observe faithfully all the commandments and the laws, the, the chukim, the mitzvot, and the chukim, the mishpatim, which I command you this day, all these curses shall come upon you and take effect. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Curse shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Curse shall be the issue of your womb and your produce of your soil and the calving of your herd and the lambing of your flock. Curse shall you be in your comings. Curse shall you be in your goings. yud heh vav -He will let loose against you calamity, panic, and frustration in all the enterprises you undertake so that you shall <laughs> soon be utterly wiped out because of your evil doing in forsaking me. The Lord will make pestilence cling to you until putting an end to you in the land you are entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever and inflammation, with heat and drought, with blight and mildew. They shall hound you until you perish. The skies above your head shall be copper and the earth under you iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land dust and sand shall drop on you from the sky until you are wiped out. The Lord will put you to rout before your enemies and you shall march out against them by a single road, but flee from them by many roads. 
and you shall become a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And it goes on and on and on. You see, it's not a joke that we, <laughs> that these things happen to us. It's the fact that we have created our own religion. We have said, you know what, what God says, ah, let him say what he wants. This is what I say. And the rabbis have made rules, the extra rules. The Talmud is huge, like other religions. Christianity has a new book that they say the Torah is no longer valid. Now it's the New Testament that yeah. God made a new way for us, that no longer do we have to pay for our own sins. Jesus died for us and he'll pay for our sins. That's not in the Torah. The Torah says if you sin, you have to do, you make restitution. You have to do something about it. And he, he gave us a way. Then you have Islam with the Quran. They're the latest ones. They say the Christianity and the Torah are no longer valid. Now it's Islam. You have other religions. The Hinduism, the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. You have the books of the Buddha. You have so many books. How do we know what is truth? There's only one ultimate truth, and that's our search. But I looked in every one of those books. I looked in Hinduism. I looked in Buddhism. I looked in the occult. I looked in Christianity. And I found it in the Torah. Because what I started to see, that as I began to obey his commandments, my life changed. My life turned from despair into joy from fear into happiness and trust. I've learned how to trust God. And then, and the more I trust him, the more I see him working in my life in so many ways. You, it's, it's hard to explain. I see it every single day of my life, Sonia, every day. And the more you get to know me, the more, the more stories will come out about how God works in our lives. And that's why I've dedicated my life now to having people read what God wrote through Moses. He gave it to Moses. But the only thing written in stone were the Ten Commandments. Moses went up on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights. He heard God's voice. He spent that time while God wrote with his own finger these commandments, and he brought them down and he handed them, them to us. And God said, these are the only things that you need to obey. And they're not easy. You know, the last five I didn't get into. The last five says you shall not commit premeditated murder. The last five are about how we treat our neighbor. Don't steal from them. Don't take their wives. Don't gossip against them. And don't be jealous of anything they have. Be happy for people. Those are really hard. And when Yeshua was asked how to sum up the Ten Commandments, he said, love God with all your heart, your soul, your might, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So that's why we spend all this time every week reading what God wrote to a very simple people. He didn't, there were no rabbis at, at Mount Sinai. There were no priests or imams or any holy people, so they say. They were just freed slaves, people like you and me, everyday people, Israelite and non-Israelite, Jew and Gentile at the base of Mount Sinai. That's what we're doing here on this little study. And most people don't want to hear God's words. They would rather leave it to the religious people to tell them what to do. Just like we would rather leave to the doctors to tell us what to do, we don't take responsibility to eat the right foods, to exercise, to do the things that are going to keep us healthy. Ah, we'll take this pill. Ah, we'll do this. We let other people be in control of our lives. We give control to the government. We give control to the teachers. We give control. We don't want the responsibility. But that's not what God wants from us. He gave us a kep, a cup, 
so that we could think for ourselves. Like Jerry was saying, he gave us a free will so we could choose to do what's wrong and what's right. And what's right, how do we judge it? By the Ten Commandments, by the Torah. That's our guideline. When you say, uh, if you obey God, if you don't obey God, you're going to be cursed. So if it shows me that it's kind of uh, scary, you know, if you're going to not obey God, you're going to be punished. Okay, let me, let me give you so, this example. Sonia, do you have children? Yes. Okay, you remember when they were small? Yes. What if you were in the kitchen and you were making a, a chicken soup on the stove and it was hot? And the kids were running around your legs and you kept telling them, stay away from the stove. Because if you push the, the, the soup on the stove, it's going to fall on your head and you're going to get burnt. Okay? You're warning them. If they don't obey you, something could happen and they're going to be hurt. Let's say they don't listen and you turn around and you go over to the fridge to open the fridge and they go to the stove and they pull up, the, they pull the soup down on them and they're burnt. Were they punished? Were you wrong in warning them? Is it your fault? You told them what to do. They're not cursed. They are experiencing the consequences of their disobedience. They got hurt. God is a loving God, and he's telling us, I'm giving you the way so that you don't allow the enemies to come against you because he knows that there's evil out there. He wants to protect us like a loving father. I know it's hard to understand, but we're not, literally the, the word in Hebrew are not curses, even though they sound like it no. in English. We are, the, I don't like the word to be cursed. You right. know? That's the way obey, that we translate. Obey. Why do I obey? Why do I have to obey? It's because not, if you don't, it's not so much obey, but you do the right thing. Because yes. if you're not going to right thing, you're going to get hurt. Exactly. It's so semantic. it's not like cursing or obeying. Right. To me, obeying is like, you it's know. Master. Yeah, it's not. You no, know, I understand the word. Like if you, it, it's not about the way we use the word obey could be misunderstood. It's not like you're um, following a, a fascist dictator. And if you don't do this, that's going to happen. Right. But the wording could it's like a loving better. parent. It, 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 it's not. It's more um, God is here. God is not saying these things for us to lead uh, a strict, uh, a repressed life. He's, he's really, like Peggy was saying, a loving God. And, and in obeying God, there's joy. Like there's joy in doing the right thing. It's not, you know, a mean fascist dictator saying, if you don't do this, this is going to happen. So maybe the wording, you have to understand it's, what those words mean. I would like to put it in a different way. You okay. know, not so much obey. I don't like that word obey and curse and punishment. It's if you do the right thing, okay, you're going to be rewarded for it. Right. If you do the wrong thing by touching a stove and it's hot, you know, you're going to, you're going to, not punish, you're but gonna you're going to be hurt. You, you're going to be hurt. You will suffer you the know? consequences. That's right. Exactly. So exactly. That, it's all semantics, but that's exactly it. But, but sometimes you... there's more subtle uh, ways in which uh, uh, obedience takes place. Like, for example, um, well, I don't know if I should go there now with the trans thing, Peggy. I don't know. Maybe it's not the time. But there's certain moral principles because of, of the very nature of creation, that it's a, a creation of order, etc. So there's certain things that are maybe more subtle than talking than the example of a stove. You know, it's like uh, let's say promiscuity and running around and sleeping around. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, the reason God doesn't want that in our lives is because in the end, we suffer from that or we, or we become hardened in our ability to love properly. So there are moral principles, which God talks about too, which are not directly as, as obvious as, as let's say the, 
a scalding pot type of uh, comparison. But God is a God of order, a God of goodness, God of grace. And these things we just learn bit by bit. But the commandment and the uh, what you're saying about uh, curses and all that, maybe it's a language that's a bit old fashioned. May it better, like Peggy, like you were saying, that there are consequences of our actions, you know, even of our moral choices. You know, we're living in a world now that's changing rapidly and is very, to me, you know, it's very anti God in, in the way that you know, the way that we live our lives, you know, God gave us a moral code, you know, uh, uh, it's not, you know, people say, well, what's what good for you isn't good for me, but that's not true. What's good for, what's really good for you is really good for me. Like that's what God is saying. It's not like a morality that of, of, you know, each individual decides what's right and wrong in the world. And, and, and that's to me what, the Ten Commandments are all about. Well, how do you have to make your own decision and think what is right and what is wrong? How do you make that decision? Well, what is the right thing to do or is the wrong thing? Yeah, but that's why there's several ways of, of understanding that. The first of all, you need you need a code, a moral code. Every nation has its own moral code. And you need a moral code by which you judge right and wrong. You know, like Hitler had a very different moral code. We know that murder is wrong because of the Ten Commandments. God said, you shall not murder, period. No premeditated murder. He didn't say you shall not kill because the first, when we when we left Egypt, the first thing he did was form an army. The IDF was 4,000 years old. You know, we, we had to defend ourselves. So, um, each each so the, the the constitution of israel of our people is the 10 commandments and we have to learn what they are and they help us and when we live by them we prosper we feel better we're healthier he says that he tells us that but when we go against it then we start to suffer as you say suffer the consequences so there is a moral code by which we live, and that's given to us in the Torah. And it's very important for us to keep that. So, but what, what was the other part of your question? Who? You, Sonia. Me? Yeah, how no. do you know how to, to do what's what, right and wrong? Yeah, because yeah. you think thinking what is right and what is wrong. It's right yeah. for me, but maybe... It's interesting because one of the things that it says is that we we are all made in God's image. Every human being has the spirit, the, the ruach, and the shama breathed into us at the moment of conception. What you are unique, Sonia. There isn't another person like you in this entire world. God made you very special. Each one, in each and every one of us here, is unique. And, and special. what? Even if you're identical twin, uh, you look exactly yeah. the same. Those twins are different. Inside. Exactly. Even if an identical twin is is not the same as his, as his brother or sister, we are each given a ruach, a spirit. The body is separate, but we're connected. We're interconnected. You cannot separate the body, mind, and spirit. We're one. Even sometimes I'm I get shocked. I inside I still feel very young. And I'll look in the mirror and I go, who is that person? You know, you see all your wrinkles, you see <laughs> yourself deteriorating, but that's the body. It's not the spirit. The spirit is eternal. And that's a gift from God. God gave us each a spirit. And through the spirit, we connect with him. Through the spirit, he speaks to us, he guides us. So that's is, uh, Peggy, is spirit, the soul, you're talking about the soul of the, the person. Neshama, yes. Neshama. The neshama, exactly. That's it's how we spirit. connect. Yeah. That's how we connect with him. And, and he implanted these commandments in us when we are, as soon as we are conceived, it's like we have that in us. 
So when we hear it later, it resonates with us. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's the way we should live. Unfortunately, some of us grow up in very difficult circumstances. We may have a very unhappy home with unloving parents. Um, right now, you have a whole nation of people in the Middle East who raise their children to hate the Jews. All these, these terrorists, are they're not born terrorists. They've learned to hate us. Mm -hmm. But this, hasn't, this didn't start yesterday. And if you read the Torah, like if you read the Torah, you'll see the history. You'll see the history of Hamas and all these nations. It started when, as soon as we left Egypt with the Amalekites, that that tribe that came against us. And you you read the history of our people. Everything starts to make sense because we were different. We we're following different ideas, a different religion. We didn't accept anybody else's religion. Exactly. We stick to, to, to Torah, to the Ten Commandments. Exactly. Why, did, why, God, why God is doing giving this to the Jewish nation? Why Jewish nation? We think that God is, the Jews is the, um, what is it called? <laughs> we are the chosen people. Chosen people, right. I know. My father used to say, why did he choose us? Let him yeah. choose somebody else for a change. <laughs> well, we don't have a choice, Sonia. We're chosen. And that's it. We have to accept. Sorry, what? Brian. That is uh, with the gentle people that came with us out of Egypt. Exactly. The, together, and Brian's right. It's not only the Jews, it's the Gentiles who chose to be with us, like Ruth. Ruth left the Moabites and she she went, left Mo, Moab with her with her mother-in-law, and she joined with us. So it we're we're made up of a nation of many uh, of people who were chosen. And the, the chosen, those who were chosen. It's as if you're chosen to be the president of the United States. You're held at a higher standard. Unfortunately, today, they're not living in such a high standard. But when you are given a role, you are held to a higher standard. And But God helps us. We're not there alone. He helps us when we're willing to follow him, to be obedient to his words, he gives, he's, he's right there with us. If you read in the Torah, you'll see that the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments went before us in battle with the Kohanim blowing the Shofarim. When we went to war, they knew that the God of Israel was with us. And, and people were afraid. But they were afraid when they heard us coming because they said, this God is different. He's, he's the real thing. This in the Haftorah portion this week is a story of um, a Syrian officer named Naaman. And Naaman came down, he was a commander of the army, very important. And he came down with leprosy, tsa'arat. It, it was a skin disease. And there was, and there was a young Jewish girl who had been held captive, just like they're held captive there. She was held captive when Syria, the Syrian army went in and took slaves. And she said to his, to Naaman's wife, she said, you know, if only Naaman would go to our prophet in Israel, he would be cured. So she went to Naaman, to her husband, and she said what this little girl said. And the man who is so proud said, "Isn't this river the the and I, Syria has bigger rivers? Why should I? Why should I go there?" No, no, sorry, sorry, I mixed it up. What he did was he said, "Okay, I'm going to send a letter um, through the king. You know what? Let me read it. Hang on a second. Let me go to it. Let me open it up because I just read it today." Shabbat. We can read it this way together. This is Haftaratza, uh, no, Tazria. Okay. So I'm going to share this screen and we can read it together. Here. Haftara. Is it this one? 
Tazria. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So it says here, a man from Baal Shalisha brought the man of God, meaning Elisha, bread from the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, fresh grain in a sack. And he said, give it to the people so that they may eat. And his servant says, how can I set this before a hundred people? But he said, give the people that they may eat. For this is what the Lord says. They shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was an important man to his master and held high in esteem, for through him God had granted victory to Aram. He was also a, ma a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Once when the Arameans were out raiding, they brought a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she attended to Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master would come before the prophet in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. She went in and told her Lord what the girl from Israel, the land of Israel said. The king of Aram said, go, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent Naaman, my courtier, to you, that you may cure him of leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and he cried, Am I God, able to kill and make alive, that this man writes to me to cure a man of leprosy? See how he's seeking an occasion to go against me. When Elisha, the man of God, the prophet of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Brian, put your thing on mute. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a message to him, telling him, Go and bathe in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be pure. But Naaman was angry, and he went away, and he said, I thought that he would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Aren't Amana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? I could bathe in them and be pure. So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and spoke to him. My father, if the prophet had told you to do some difficult thing, wouldn't you have done it? How much more when he says to you, bathe and be pure? So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the bidding of the man of God. And his flesh became like a little child's, and he was pure. And he returned to the man of God. He and all his company stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. He urged him to take it, but he refused. Now, you can't buy a God. The prophet knew that. Naaman said, then at least let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will never again offer up burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods except to the Lord. But may God pardon your servant for this. When my master enters the house of Ramon, to worship there, and he leans on my hand when I prostrate myself in the house of Rimon. May the Lord pardon your servant in this. And he said to him, go in peace. I guess he, he felt uh, that he couldn't tell the people uh, they already, uh, that he couldn't not bow down to. Uh, anyway, it's interesting, exactly. you know, when they talk about the flourishing of hands and how other people, you know, you see so many religious people doing that, you know. He, he said, why don't you just let me go in the river and pronounce to your God like a big flourishing, uh, all these movements and gestures and gesticulation. And and God is a God of, you know, it's a quiet, the stillness. He, he knows our heart. 
we can't fool him, which all are, are, you know, there are some people who give a lot of money, but they give a lot of money to charity, but they want their name up there. They want a plaque. They want everybody to know. And God is saying, when you give, don't make a big deal. Give in, give in quiet. Not everybody has to know. Give from your heart. Just because people call themselves religious doesn't mean that they're doing it for the right motives. You may think they are, but they may, they may say, look how kosher I am. I eat only this food. But then they go and they steal from their neighbor. They do, they make a business deal that that's that is they charge too much interest, or they'll do something that goes completely goes against what God wants. So we have to be careful when we say, what happened to all those religious people? There are some who are true followers of God and some who put on a mask. Only God knows our heart. Also, there are consequences in our lives of other people's wrongdoings. I yes. mean, you see young babies of two months, two months dying. I mean, uh, the world is just such a, there's been so much disobedience and evil in the world that we all end up paying the consequences. The world is no longer, you know, a safe, totally, there are safe places, but a safe, beautiful place. We all suffer the consequences. Even when you walk down the street, you have yeah. to be careful somebody doesn't mug you, or, like when it's dark outside. So there's always a, there are always consequences of our own behavior, but also of other people's behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, I listened to a story. You were hearing many of the stories of the people who were held captive in the tunnels. And there was a story of a young girl. She was telling us, I could send it to you if you want to hear it. Her name was Safira. And she, she said that the month before the October 7th massacre, <clears throat> she had this urge. She lived in Israel. She had an urge to read Psalm 28. And she was reading it, and it's all about, um, uh, you know, the war, all about, um, um, oh, what did she say? Um, enemies and, and, and war. And she couldn't understand what was, why she had to read it. But every single day she read this, this Psalm 28. And then just before the, the concert, the, you know, that big concert, she asked, told her, her boyfriend that she wanted to go and he didn't want to go. He kept saying, I have a bad feeling. I don't want to be there. I don't want to go. And, uh, but she convinced him and they went to the concert and um, they were they were taken into captivity into the tunnels in Gaza. And she said, suddenly, she understood the psalm that God would be with her in war or wherever she was, he was going to watch out over her. And she said she had this peace, this almost that she was in the right place, that this is where God wanted her. And she saw the 16-year-old girl who was so miserable and crying. And, and she, she went over and she was giving her comfort. And, and even, she said, there was even a, a Hamas, a, a terrorist there, who looked at her and he said, every time I come in here and I see you, I feel better. It's like she had the presence of God in her giving her such a sense of peace and and purpose. And she stayed with this young girl and protected her and talked to her and, would, and she would read this psalm to her. And then she was let go. She was one of the, the, the people who were set free. Unfortunately, the boyfriend is still there and held the captivity. But it's, you know, that psalm that King David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My A table you prepare in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. So often I would say that and a sense of God's peace would come over me. It's, it's, you can't explain it, Sonia. God's presence in our lives is so real in each of our lives but we, we just have to ask for it 
and be willing to obey him. You know, if I had obeyed my father, when he, he would warn me about certain things, not to do this and not to do that, I didn't want to listen. And I made big mistakes. Now, before I make a decision, I go to my friends, I speak to Miriam, I speak to other people in my community, and I ask for advice. I don't just jump by myself. God gives us a community for a reason, because in numbers we are strong. And, and, uh, and that's where the chokhmah, the wisdom comes. There's wisdom in the Torah, in the books of the Bible. And he wants us to read it. So that's why we're doing this. And I think it's very, very important for us to continue doing it. And eventually you get your answers. Some things we will never know because the secret things belong to God. And what he wants us to know, he gives us to know. What is the difference by being religious or not being religious or following the Torah, but not being religious? Or is it? That, that's a very, very a... good question. And by reading the Torah, you begin to know what that means. Because there's a difference between being a religious person and being a person who has a relationship with the creator. Um... When you have a relationship with somebody, it's a give and take. It's an intimacy. It's like you know that somebody is watching over you. Someone is protecting you. When you're religious, you do things by rote. You say, okay, I get up in the morning. I got to put this shoe on first before that one. I have to do, I have to say my, you know, my prayers first thing in the morning. Or if I go out of my house, and I don't kiss the mezuzah, something terrible is going to happen. You know, there's a lot of, of these rules that God never asked us to do. So you know, who like, asked it to do? Where is it written to do it? It's Talmud. There's a very big difference between the rabbi's teachings and the Talmud. Some are right. Some are opinion. There's the opinion of man versus the the the. Um, what God asks us to do. Like for Pesach, Pesach is coming up. Yeah. You, have, you have very many, you have a whole gamut, array of things that you could do to prepare for Pesach. If you're very religious, I just heard of a person, a very wealthy religious Jewish person who bought a second home just to have it for Pesach. Yeah. That is That's Mishigas. It. That's the sense. ultimate religion. Do you know the only thing that God asked us for Pesach? Every, every year, he tells us on the first day to have the Seder, to remember the Pesach, the, the lamb, to eat the lamb. And then he says, take all the yeast, the leaven, out of your homes. Don't eat any leaven for seven days. That's it. Don't eat leaven. Get it out of the house. It represents the chametz, the leaven in our hearts. The yeast represents being puffed up, being proud. Look at this Naaman. He was so upset because here this, this prophet said to him, go and dunk in this little river. Now imagine this man wanted a fanfare he wanted somebody to wave his magic wand and say, you are healed. No, he had to go into the Jordan and dunk once and come up and go down again twice and come up and three times and come up all the way to seven times. And every time, he, more and more of his pride was being broken. God wants us to remember the pride of, the, of Pharaoh. Look what Pharaoh's pride did to Egypt. He wants us to be humble because only humble people can learn. We are humble enough to be able to be, to be able to follow instead of lead. You can't lead until you're willing to follow. And it's not an easy thing to do because we have such strong egos. And God is saying, you know what? I know better than you. And I'm telling you, this is what you need to do. It's like our children. The first thing that they say when they're two years old, no, 
I do it myself. Mm -hmm. You know that. They don't want to listen to us. And mm -hmm. then they're teenagers. No, I know better. Who's, who are you to tell me what to do? Yeah. That's our nature. So it, when you read the Torah, then you can discern what is a relationship with the creator and what is the religion of man. Look at what religion is doing in the world today. The religion divides people. Yeah. Relationship unites people. God wants us united. He chose one nation, took us out of the Goyim. We were all Goyim. There, was only, there were no Jews yet. He's called on Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And you read that story. It's wonderful. And he chose this nation. We are the apple of his eye. And we, he says, I'm going to give you a gift. These pearls of wisdom, bring them to the world. And then everyone will live in peace. How was the Jewish people created? Who was the first one? Of, how did it start? With Abraham. Oh, you but you before. say Abraham, Abraham wasn't Jewish. No, Nobody he wasn't. Was Jewish. There were no Jews. There were no Jews. He went to Abraham, to Isaac. Oh. Isaac wasn't a Jew. And then Jacob. Jacob was a twin. Jacob was tw Esau and Jacob. Jacob became the father of Israel. And Esau became the father of the Edomites a non-Jew, because it's a calling, it's a chosenness. But that's why we're reading the Torah, so we'll learn the history. So if you come on every week, you'll learn the answers to these questions. That's why we're, why we're doing this, because most of we, we are, our people are perishing because of lack of knowledge, knowledge of the Torah, knowledge of God. We know religion, don't do this and don't do that and don't eat this and don't eat that. That's not what God is asking from us. He's asking us, he's telling us what to do in the Torah. And you're not Jewish. You're I, not I thought it was all in the Torah. All the rituals and kashrut and open the light, not to open the no, light, not to allow to. No, it's in the Talmud. No, it's in the Talmud. So what is Talmud? Talmud is called the oral Torah. After the Jews were dispersed from Jerusalem, when the Romans came in and kicked us out, actually the Talmud started before that Babylon. in Babylon. The Babylonian Talmud was the beginning. When, the, when we were kicked out of Israel, we were kicked out of the land. There was a reason yeah. we were kicked out. We didn't obey God. Every seventh year, there was called the Shemitah. We were to leave the land alone. Just like every seven days, we keep Shabbat. Every seventh year, we leave the land. We give the land a Shabbat. We didn't obey God. And God told us, for, and, and a lot of other things we didn't do. We were kicked out into Babylon. That was the first expulsion. This is why we read the Torah. It's the history of our people. So we know what to do and what not to do. And the rabbis, when we were outside the land, started to make what's called a fence around the Torah, the, what they called the law. The law were the Ten Commandments. Those were the basics. So they mm -hmm. started to make these extra rules so that if you broke those, it wouldn't be so bad. But don't break the Torah because that's going to get keep us kicked out of, the, out of the land of Israel. The Talmud is books and books and books of commentaries of the rabbis. That's what most people think of when they think of the Torah. But there's the written Torah, the Torah written by Moses, and there's the oral Torah written by the rabbis. And the rabbis have said, if we, if there's enough of us, we have the right to change what was written. And you cannot change what God wrote or we get into chavtsuras. And that's what's happening to us. We've changed too many things till we don't even know right from wrong anymore. We don't know. What what is, I mean, what's the reason that they would want to change it? To protect us. The to rabbis? Yeah, to protect the people from breaking the 10, they made a whole bunch of others. They, oh. they, they made the 613, or and they added another 603, plus all the other things. It's enough to make you mashige. But there's also a kind of pride involved also. Like, 
it's it's you know it's not just to protect us it's like when you see people um who do things that are just really far out and they're they lose you know when they when you try and follow something so like exactly sometimes you lose the essence of what the reason is like if you're having want to have a relationship with god and and you, you become so picky because you want to make sure you do everything exactly right it, it almost becomes more arrogance than than uh to me it's more that than than trying to super protect us it's like you know you the, the pride about i'm i'm the leader of i'm such a big leader and i've written this book and that book and it becomes you know that's why there are people who worship their their rebbes they worship them as if they were god incarnate you know so yeah. it, it's the i think it's an ego thing me personally because there are some things in the talmud which are good you know and and like rabbi uh, uh you know our rabbi used to say keep what's good and and what's not in keeping with the torah it's not in keeping but then there are things that are 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 added you know it's like you know, this one does a commentary and that one, and it almost becomes, yeah. to me, it, it seems sometimes like arrogance. Almost, yeah, because uh, this this one won't, this, this food isn't kosher enough. I got to get that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have, and, a, I have a, actually, oh, sorry. I have a friend, a good friend, and, and I'm not saying this to be against her, but just what this particular incident was almost laughable. And it was a mistake. I know this person loves God, but a one person, one time they, they, they have a pet dog, okay? And on and they have a house with a yard. Now, on Shabbat, they would give the dog to their neighbor because they didn't want to clean up, scoop up the poop on, on Shabbat because that's work. Now, you know, that's really stretching what what the Shabbat means. You know, it, it's it's we all go to the bathroom. It's like saying I can't flush the toilet. So she didn't want to have that this couple. They didn't want to have to scoop it on a Saturday. So they gave their dog gave the dog to a neighbor, uh, somebody who didn't keep the Shabbat. So I'm saying there's a lot of this stuff which is to me Michigas. It's but it's, it's the you know, same when you thing. Follow, you don't fo you follow the what is that expression? You don't fo you follow the letter of law, law instead of the essence of the law i forget but when you you start to drown in the details yeah it's like that you know we are to be a light to the gentiles a light to the nation we don't you know it's it says the shabbat is for everyone it was for the for the the, the gentiles too it's for all people it was given to us right at the beginning we don't hire uh, uh, hire a Shabbat goy, a Shabbos goy, to come in and open our lights. That's religion. How is that being a light to the nations? You see, this is the type of thing we're talking. This also what we're the, I, what we're teaching here, what we're doing here, is getting outside the box of religion, and looking, going to the essence of what God says. And not many people like that. They want to fit into the rest with the rest. I don't care. I want to be with God. If if I have to choose a side, I'm going to choose God. You look confused, Sonia. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out uh, what is what is the difference. You know, like is it God or is it the religion? Uh, how is it combined together? Well, it some depends what you're talking in, about. Some things is written in the Torah, right? That's yeah. what the uh, God made the commandments to follow, you know, certain things. Yeah. But that's religion is also the same. Maybe I think it's, I think you're Again, words, semantics. Uh, 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 semantics, it's the words you're misunderstanding. Everybody, who, there are all sorts of people in all sorts of religions who actually really have a relationship with God. You know, they you you could go alone onto a desert island and God could reveal Himself to you, and you don't even maybe don't know the Ten Commandments. So many people of all religions have a relationship with God. 
So, and, and some things in all these books probably are, are the truth and close to God. But it's when we start adding things, you know, that it becomes, let's not use the, the word religion, but it becomes, it becomes extra. It's not what God wants, you know. I mean, it, it, it's, you can go to many synagogues and many rabbis love God and really have a relationship with God. It's just we sometimes uh, get arrogant and want to do it our way. You know, some of the ways we're saying, like not having a dog on Shabbat. Like all these things, that's just a mild thing. But then there, then there are, look at all these leaders in different religions who were arrested for having like a, a illegal, like a young girls in relationships, like all these things. And they're say, saying they're religious leaders. In all religions, we've had, we've seen some of this stuff. So what we're trying to do is boil down, what does it mean to be alive on this planet? If there's a God who who actually talks to us, uh, it's such an incredible thing that you can have a relationship with this power that is great, greater than anything we know. It's like the very being, like, why are we here? I mean, I know on my journey, I just would look, look around and say, what's this all mean? Why am I here? So uh, even if you didn't have any book to read, a Torah, nothing, at some point, God could could reveal himself to you. You know, uh, there, there are many people who've had that experience, who've had an experience. I remember a friend of mine, well, she was actually Catholic, but she wasn't mm. really, she wasn't really in the, she wasn't really involved in whatever, but she had such an experience with God that it just changed her whole life. And so it's beyond, you know, it's words that we're misunderstanding. My, when my parents were, when I was, when we were younger, my parents were alive. Religion meant they used it interchangeably, like, oh, oh, are you religious? They were really asking, do you believe in God? So we have to like almost establish what we mean when we say these words. It's the difference between having an honest relationship with something, the Creator that's so much bigger than us, and it gives meaning to all this thing we call life, as opposed to you know, follow this and 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 get uh, somebody else to shut the lights because we cannot shut the lights on Shabbat. Like that's what I mean. It's 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 one is an honest, honest opening up of the heart and yearning for something more, and the other is is more concerned with what other people think. I mean, that's my take on this. Okay. Well, I think for tonight, we've got talked about a lot of things. Sonia, you're certainly welcome to, um, you know, come back and go through the Torah with us. This I, We change the format tonight. Usually what we do is we read. We read what it says, and we go through this every week. So little by little, our eyes open up and we see things. I've been, I've been reading the Torah for 35 years. So, wow. and every year I see more, something new in it, and, and it's changed my life. I can just say that. So if you have another 35 years, <laughs> in the other world, you know. Okay, so let's say even 10. 10 is 10 is good. You can learn a lot in 10 years. Um, in, in the meantime, Jerry, do you want to do the ironic? We'll end with the ironic benediction. This is the the um the prayer that the uh, the Cohen oh, okay. gave to Israel. Okay, so uh this is, and uh, Peggy's going to tell you that in English, uh, but uh, you you understand a bit of Hebrew, Sonia, anyhow, eh? No? I thought you did. Okay. Anyhow. And this blessing is oh, said God. for uh, parents to children, and uh, and it's always, this blessing is always given with love. Biahabo. Baruch Atar and I, Elohim Melcho Elohim, I share Kirishano Bidu Shasoi, Shell Aaron, the Tifon Levarech is Amo Israel, the Ahavo Yavorecho Adonai, the Ishmarecho Yah Adonai. Oh no, they let go. 
ויחונה כה ישו אדוני הנאו אליכו ויושם לכו שלום. ושמו את שמי על בני ישראל ואני ארבורכם. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. And we certainly need his blessings now. So I thank you all for being with us tonight, with me tonight. And um, God willing, we'll see you next week for the, the portion called Mitzorah. We didn't really get into Tazriah. But uh, we'll we'll hear about it. We'll listen to our rabbi on on Shabbat speaking on Tezria, so we'll get the understanding of this of this portion. So I wish you all good night. Sleep yeah. well. God Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank Anytime. You. I'll Sunday. be back. I'll be back. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. God bless you all. Bye. Yes.